instead of the web stack or the open stack? So um, Ubuntu One is not open source. Interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> all the clients and all the things that hook into it are open source, but the back end itself is not. It, I mean, it could be using OpenStack for all I know, but yeah, they don't they don't release the server code. And I think that's also it's more like a Dropbox sort of thing than like a you can run anything on this cloud kind of thing. Yeah, good question. <laughs> I asked it too. <laughs> Any other questions for me? But I got a couple of questions. Yes. <coughs> uh, this has to do more with uh, the nature of work. So, if you were to compare your experience of working with Ubuntu through the community versus HP and OpenStack as a job, what are some of the things that are common and what are some of the things that are different in your experience? Should I repeat it for the camera? Sure, definitely. Yeah. So, my, my experience sort of working with, with Ubuntu in the community as opposed to working for HP and OpenStack in a company. Um, in some ways, I, I prefer working with Ubuntu because I have complete autonomy. Like, I can just stop working for a week and there's no one. I mean, people don't care, but like, I can. <laughs> Obviously, with a job, you can't really do that. Um, and I, I, cannot, I also have more freedom as to what I want to work on. Um, on OpenStack, I'm pretty much on the infrastructure team, so I'm working on infrastructure-related and QA sort of stuff. But in Ubuntu, like, I'm on the community council, and the last cycle, the docs team ran into some trouble. Um, just like the translation team, the lead guy sort of just, like, he quit. And so no one knew how to release docs, we didn't know how to upload the packages, we didn't know any of it. So fortunately, he hung around long enough to teach us things, but, in, but I just shifted my effort from other projects I was working on to working on that. Um, and I was able to do that, like I just, I can do whatever I want to do once you're like, I can choose, um, whereas OpenStack I have more restrictions. Um, but there's also something to be said for working in a community that's mixed, volunteer, and paid, and working in a community where, that, where most of the people are paid, um, because there have been situations where it feels like the paid contributors somewhat take advantage of the volunteers, or it, you can get into strange situations where you don't feel like you're being properly compensated or properly appreciated, or you know, they assume you're going to be there, you're taken for granted, and other things. Um, and that can feel not so nice, and that's a very demotivating thing. I've seen it happen a few times in Ubuntu where community members, um, especially when they're working on something and they're developing something, and then Canonical comes by and says, actually, we're getting rid of this thing and we're going to go in this direction instead. Um, that sort of thing won't happen in OpenStack because all of the decisions are made in public and there's no comp there's no one company making decisions. Um, whereas in, o in, in Ubuntu, sometimes there are decisions that come down from Canonical that no one else really has control of. And that can be very unfortunate. They try not to do it, but they, they keep doing it. <laughs> um, and so mostly I, I try to work on things that don't really, they don't, they're, they're not going to impact me in my doc work or my newsletter or other like localized California things. Um, so I have to be somewhat strategic about what I work on even in Ubuntu um, because some things really, it's just all paid developers and everything's developed inside Canonical. Um, they've tried to do a lot of things like having Google Hangouts and more public IRC chats, um, but what happens when you have one company controlling interest in the project? Because they like accidentally have private meetings. Like they're at the water cooler and they're chatting about something, and all of a sudden they have a new idea for something. And if you're part of the community, you're not part of that. Um, so there's a fair amount of that that happens in the Ubuntu community. Even when they try not to do things in secret, sometimes they accidentally do things in secret. And in OpenStack, that's not really possible. Um, in order to push a feature through, um, you need community involvement and community consensus and you need to be able to work through that blueprint. Like if you came to OpenStack and dumped, you know, a 4,000 line patch, like that would never get through. Everyone would, there would be riots and power outages and things. <laughs> that would not happen. There has to be much more consensus. So it, it's funny that, that working in a project with a lot of companies is more transparent than working in a project that has more volunteers in it. <laughs> It's interesting thing for me to learn. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, how low is the bar do you think is for people who can to join open source projects? Um, so how, how high is the bar? Like, it depends on, on the project. Um, so 
Like, the lowest one when you take the I mean, the lowest one is like writing summaries in my newsletter. If you know how to read an article and write a two sentence summary, you can be an open source contributor. And someone who writes one summary in that newsletter can add their name to the credits. I mean, honestly, anyone can just open the Google Doc and add their name to the credits and not do anything because I don't track <laughs> anonymous edits. Um, and then you can have your, new, your name in the newsletter and then you'd have it published to the Ubuntu Planet and then just put out on all the on all resources and also your names on something. And that's for writing, you know, two sentences of a summary. Um, so it can be that simple or obviously it can be, you know, really hard doing big development stuff. Um, and depending on the project, it can be hard to find this super user, ed like lower um, entry level stuff. Um, but it's, it's definitely around, especially, I mean, because open source projects, people think you always need to be a coder and really super geeky and all this other stuff. So that means we have like a serious hole of creative people. <laughs> like, if you saw websites for open source projects ten years ago, like they burn your eyes. They look like my slides. <laughs> they're really, really bad, and they're covered in text, and they're not pretty. Because if open source just really lacked people like with artistic talent and design and other things. Um, because no, none of those types of people were coming into open source. So we're getting better. Websites look better than my slides. <laughs> um, interfaces are getting much better. Ubuntu looks pretty slick these days, um, whereas 10 years ago it was, I mean, it looked like Windows 3.1 or something. It was from the past. <laughs> um, so we, uh, open source projects have been opening their eyes to people of diverse talents and people who aren't hugely technical. We've been finding places to put them, put them to get, get them to do work. But, it, it can be hard to get into some projects, easier to get into others. It has to be a conscious effort from the project to make it easy to contribute. Yeah. You said, I was just curious because you said 4,000 lines of code. I was just wondering what your average you would say when you submit something for review. What's your, your, your average? So we sort of have like a, a social community limit. Like if your patch is more than 400 lines, you're doing something way wrong. But I'd say like most patches are like 20 lines. Like, they're not very big. They're usually incremental changes that are working towards a goal. Um, so I mentioned we have blueprints. So at the beginning of a cycle, a six month cy release cycle, um, we'll usually get together at the design summit and we'll put together a bunch of blueprints and say like, you're gonna work on this piece, you're gonna work on this piece, and we all sort of delegate everything. And then sort of as the release goes, we start adding flags to different things, we start adding new features, and it all sort of happens pretty slowly in incremental changes. So a patch really shouldn't be very big. Um, that was something I had to teach the HP people um, <laughs> who are trying to open source stuff because they're used to like collaboratively like getting in a room and coding something together over like three weeks and then landing like this massive change. And I had to explain to them in open source that like you don't really do it that way. You do it slowly and you test your changes and then you put them in a little more and they're just horrified. It's a whole different world than <laughs> like some of the traditional software development. Did you? Yeah, I was just wondering, is, is there a high demand for a particular uh, group of people? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on the project, but I, I said we don't have a lot of art people and documentation people, but honestly, like, most projects still need more developers. So um, developers still in high demand. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a problem that sort of feeds itself. Like, the bigger the project gets, the you, you sort of need, like, exponentially more contributors because it gets harder to manage and harder to maintain, and people leave and people come back. And, with some open source projects, like a project will like grind to a halt if someone gets a job, <laughs> or they leave college because like there's a lot of college students who get, who get involved in open source and put in a ton of time while they're in school, and then they get a job and they get married and they have kids and all of a sudden they have no time. <laughs> so um, there's always a big need for developers. What can um, the business information systems major student can I mean graduate can help with uh, open source? I mean, there's what are we <laughs> qualified to do because we're not coders, definitely. I mean, we're not going to get into development. But what else? I mean, I mean, so there's, I mean, there's, there's things like you can do support. Like if you're familiar with pieces of software, you can help on online forums and do things like that. Um, but there's also things like um, marketing for projects. Um, so Ubuntu, you can't really do marketing because that's handled by the company. Um, but there's other software um, out there that allows you to do sort of helping promote the software and like find where users have pain points. Um, there's sort of a rise in people doing um, UI testing 
in open source, because um, it used to be that like all the interfaces were terrible. You're familiar with Drupal. It's gotten better, like way better. <laughs> the interface used to be like written by, I don't know, crazy developer people who have brains that are not like mine. <laughs> I don't know how they organized Drupal, but it was like not built for humans. Um, so there's been an influx of like user experience people coming in. And also just regular people who like open up, you know, they open I'm gonna pick on Drupal. They open up Drupal and say, I don't even know how to create a post. So they'll work with, with uh, the developers to start drafting up workflows and things that work better for them. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that other people can get involved who aren't necessarily developers. Um, also submitting bugs when you ran, run into a bug in a piece of software. Um, I mean, as, as someone who's done some development, like I, I had a very strict testing regime with my software, and so I test all the things that I cared about and everything else. Like it sort of got ignored. So if people weren't submitting bugs, I wouldn't even know about software problems. So I couldn't even fix them because I didn't know about them. Um, and one of the things I love about open source is you can submit bugs. Um, every time I work on a piece of proprietary software, I'm like, this is a bug, where do I report it? Don't report bugs in proprietary software. There's no bug tracker. You can't see if anyone else has had this problem. So things like reporting bugs and doing testing and other things um, don't really have a high technical barrier um, to them. Yeah. Is there like a software development kit or some tool to download to, to work on a project like Ubuntu? Like, other, like a Eclipse has the Android plugin or something like that. Is there, yeah. is there anything that's similar? Or <laughs> do you just have to know how to program in whatever language? So it, it depends um, on where you're going to work. Um, the Ubuntu, they have like an application sort of kit now, because they're trying to take after Android and Apple and yeah. them to do like a, a development kit. So they now have one for their app developers. Um, they also have, I think they recently opened, they had developer.ubuntu.com. I think they. So this one, um, they have ways. You, I don't know what they have like downloadable as far as like Eclipse plugins and things, but I think they have a few things like that. Um, so it sort of tells you how to start developing on your Ubuntu like application wise, and then they have if you want to do actual development in. this website that, um, if it will ever load, um, uh, that has a lot of tools for if you want to start um, taking, like packaging is when you take like Firefox and then put it in a format that can run and install on your bunch of, I think their site is done. <laughs> what, what, what would you need to know, like if you wanted to do fly by Ubuntu itself, but mm -hmm. Mike, you said I can make a better start button or home folder or whatever, <laughs> what, do you do? Like, what do you have to do to do that? <laughs> Yeah, so since it's it's so modular, like there's different like if you want to do a different start thing in Firefox, it's gonna be different than if you want to do it on like the desktop. Um, it's kinds of oh, oh there it goes. That's actually the same website. Oh it's different. Slightly. They have one just for the packaging right now, I guess. Um, so it, yeah, it depends on the on the project, but you might need um, First, you need to figure out what, what software you're modifying. So Ubuntu is built off of um, the desktop UI, which is called Unity. So you may need to look into the Unity developer documentation to work on that. If you're changing something in Firefox, you have to look in Firefox. Or LibreOffice, you have to look in LibreOffice. Um, and then, well, also, they're all written in different languages. So there's like C and C++ and Python um, that things are written in. Um, so it really depends on what you want to change like and what you need to know. And I mean, like I learned a lot of this. Like when I when my, my first desktop in, um, environment that I used on Linux was called Enlightenment, and I had this little tiny like widget that was doing something really annoying to me. Like it was something I think it was showing tooltips or something, and I hate tooltips. They annoy me, especially when I don't want to see them. So I think I wanted to like disable those or something. Um, so I was able to like find that little tiny plugin that was doing that annoying thing, and like find out where in the C like I didn't know anything about programming, but like. If you, I, know, I know a little bit, um, but it was a C program, but I was able to see like where the tooltip thing was, and I was able to like comment it out and then recompile the software. So like, it was really just like sort of figuring out exactly what I wanted to change and just diving in and searching the internet for like 
what the comment style C is or something. <laughs> I'm doing things. Any other questions? Do you have any questions for us? I don't think so. <laughs> Open source is awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.